Um, now, can I start by thanking the uh, Police Superintendents Association for the invitation to be present? And Yvette sends her apologies that she cannot be here personally. Um, she had very much wanted to be here, but there's been rather dramatic developments that she is needing to uh, deal with. Um, it was great to be here yesterday to be part of what was a very interesting and very challenging question and answer session. Um, before I go any further, if I, can I pay tribute to the leadership uh, of your association? I think Irene, in particular, is an outstanding champion of all that's best in the British Police Service and has given very good leadership through very tough times. I often say about leadership, uh, in my former being as Deputy General Secretary of the old TNG and then Unite, that any fool can lead when the going is good. The true test of leadership is when the going is difficult, and it has been difficult in recent years. And Irene and your leadership uh, have discharged their responsibilities outstandingly. Um, now, this conference has been very full of thought-provoking contributions, as I saw yesterday. And I've been, I was fascinated to see how you structured the conference, tackling issues from LGBT discrimination uh, to human trafficking. Uh, friends, uh, it can sometimes get overshadowed that fundamental reason uh, why we are here. Statistics, targets, uh, reports, uh, they sometimes cloud uh, the overriding aim of policing, which is a safer, uh, more cohesive, and more just society. Policing by consent, policing in the best traditions of Robert Peel, the police are the public and the public are, are the police. Now the first duty of any government is the safety and security of its citizens. And that's why Labour developed, together with the police, uh, neighbourhood policing, putting 17,000 extra police officers and 16,000 police community support officers on the beat underpinned by local partnerships bringing together the statutory and voluntary organisations who can make a difference. Real progress was made. Crime fell by 43%. Uh, there were problems, of that there were no doubt, no doubt uh, and problems remain to this day. But what we developed together with the police was a model of neighbourhood policing celebrated worldwide uh, and that's why there's a queue of countries that come across, from across the globe uh, to the College of Policing to see just how it works. However, despite the fundamental importance uh, of policing, we have over the last four years seen a denigration uh, of the police service. A plethora of badly thought through cuts have been accompanied by a remorselessly negative tone from the government, with ministers expending energy at pointing the finger rather than supporting officers in particular managing through tough times and security. Uh, worst still, uh, we now face a reversal of a generation of progress in policing, uh, with an erosion of those elements that form the best of British policing, and in particular, neighbourhood policing. Now, let me be clear. Labour will not look the other way. Uh, Labour has been listening to you and not preaching at you. And only yesterday, I thought the debate around the use of firearms was a very good example uh, of that. Uh, we want to have an open and frank conversation about where policing is and where policing needs to go. Now, despite what others may say in the Westminster bubble, the safety and the security of the communities you serve is the reason you are all here today. And that is the reason why most Bobbies and their leadership give 101% to their jobs and why we must not ever forget to celebrate the best of British policing. For you, I know it's not just a job, it is a vocation. The NATO conference just passed is a very good example of what policing in England and Wales is capable of. It was a huge effort, uh, but through uh, the talks, in, although though the talks inside the conference uh, were difficult, the support offered by police forces uh, around the country was triumphant. And more than that, 
it was appreciated. This was demonstrated by locals uh, offering tea and cakes to officers whose job was to stand tall for hours on end on roundabouts and elsewhere. And equally, that goodwill was returned by the officers, including in uh, notes and videos that are now making their way around the Twitter sphere in recent days. Uh, watching such videos, uh, it is difficult not to feel pride in our world-class police service. It is the demonstration of public confidence in the police uh, which, despite a narrative that has been built up in the Westminster bubble around policing. Uh, surveys have shown, as I referred yesterday, uh, something very different to what you hear in the Westminster bubble, that public confidence uh, remains high, standing at roughly about 70%. And again, as I referred to it yesterday, one particular Ipsos Mori poll, uh, which put you just 1% behind the clergy. Yet despite that pride, there are worrying signs now regarding the capacity and the performance of the police service as a whole. The HMIC report released last week uh, was a salutary reminder of that. Whilst it included many very good examples of good policing practice, it also noted that trend emerging of asking victims in effect to carry out investigations themselves way beyond, way beyond uh, that which is normal and reasonable. It also pointed to a postcode lottery in terms of police response. The HMIC report prior to that had similar worrying signs when it said that uh, while forces may be making the best of austerity, there is a palpable erosion of neighbourhood policing. Indeed, speaking to officers and the public alike, as I have been doing uh, in a 50-strong nationwide tour all over England and Wales, I have been told time and again some concerning stories of the erosion of neighbourhood policing. Uh, the police neighbourhood teams in Lowestoft, for example, on the one hand, saying that increasingly the neighbourhood teams are being hollowed out, uh, uh, with police officers being taken away to response. And the public in Rossendale, on the other hand, saying that increasingly they are seeing less and less of the police in their community. Now, this is also accompanied by plummeting police morale. Uh, the recent uh, University of the West of England study uh, that showed that only one in 10 police officers uh, feel that their morale was high. Added to that has been a staggering 63% increase in the last four years in duty days lost due to anxiety amongst police officers. Indeed, the Home Affairs Select Committee itself said last year that morale, I quote, has sunk to its lowest ebb in recent history. And the health and well-being report that you produced, Irene, only earlier this week uh, showed that almost one in, f uh, uh, one in four of your officers are suffering from more, more moderate to severe anxiety, and three quarters are working unacceptably long hours. Now, increasingly, the public are seeing the consequences. Uh, above all, uh, the erosion of neighborhood policing, but also worrying signs of a justice gap developing. Violent crime up, convictions down. Sexual crime up, convictions down. Uh, and as the thin blue line is stretched ever thinner, uh, response times get ever longer, up to 30% longer. Added to this is the rapid rise in new challenges of crime, fraud, cybercrime, the immense threat posed by ISIS, and now tackling the shameful legacy of child sex exploitation. In, in a sense, potentially one of the most worrying signs uh, is that against this backdrop, Theresa May uh, is constantly touting the effectiveness of her reforms. Uh, the government is clearly not listening. Again, as I said yesterday, to be frank, what world, what planet does she live on? Now, not all the government reforms have been bad. The College of Policing had all party support. It was a good move and it has got off to a good start. However, at the heart of the government's reforms over the last four years, 
have been unprecedented cuts to our police service, with 16,000 police officers already gone, uh, and a police service taken as a whole, including support staff, that will reduce by 34,000 by 2015. Now, it's an inescapable truth that cuts would have to have been made, but they should have been led by smart savings rather than crude cuts. Again, as I said yesterday, uh, we had always said uh, that we would embrace the uh, proposals of the HMIC back five years ago that 12 per cent could come out of the police budget uh, without an impact on the front line. The government were warned, but they went significantly beyond that to 20 per cent and now more. Uh, police forces in England and Wales have seen the biggest uh, fall in police numbers of any country in Europe. Uh, and on top of that, the government has created a standoff uh, with the police service, cutting and running, uh, leaving the police to clean up the mess very often that their policies create, standing on the sideline and wagging their finger. Uh, increasingly, you, the police service, are the agency of last resort, coping with the consequences of cuts to local authorities and those with whom you work. Time and again, the government simply has not set out a, a vision, a strategy, uh, or an assessment of the risks of its policies, and we're now suffering the consequences. Looking to the future and our direction of travel. Successful reforms need several things. I know that from my former being. A clear vision for the future of what we are trying to achieve. A clear strategy for reform to ensure we build on the strengths of British policing and improve rather than undermine these strengths, uh, taking British policing backwards. And practical measures based including on smart savings and a clear analysis of risk, taking into account the level of resilience, of confidence that needs to be maintained, and the new challenges that I referred to earlier on. Now that is why Ed Miliband and Yvette Cooper set up the Stevens Commission. The Commission sought to chart uh, in the 21st century how we ensure a police service with a social purpose that combines catching uh, offenders with, crucially, work to prevent crime and divert people from crime, maintaining order, peace and well-being uh, in our communities. Preventing crime, to make the obvious point, spares the victims of crime and costs the public purse less. You've often asked for a Royal Commission. Stevens was a Royal Commission in all but name, the first since 1962. He was joined by a team of 38 national and international experts on police and crime. Uh, he engaged with over 30,000 police officers, uh, serving police officers and police staff. Uh, there were detailed discussions with 2,000 different members of the public as well as public hearings. And he collaborated with the academic community, including 47 different scholars from 28 universities who wrote 31 uh, different position papers. In short, he listened to the public and he listened to the police. Uh, he used this extensive input uh, to create what he called uh, a roadmap and what we have embraced as such for a professional evolution of the police. Built crucially on that bedrock, which is neighborhood policing, as well as underlining, uh, crucially, the importance of partnerships in order both to prevent and reduce crime. Through this, he's laid out uh, a thoughtful framework, a comprehensive framework for the future of policing. But he also found that the government has created a standoff with the police which has left officer morale at rock bottom. And he warned, and rightly so, of returning in Britain to a discredited and reactive form of policing. When Theresa May said, uh, the police, you are but crime fighters, she could not have been more wrong. Because the job is also to prevent and divert uh, and indeed, the most important thing about fighting crime is to have the cooperation of the community so that you're able to detect those wrongdoers. Now, based on the recommendations he's made, 
We are now doing what Theresa May and David Cameron should have done but never did, uh, and that is to engage. For example, the 50 Strong Tour uh, that I've been conducting. Uh, we're listening to both the public and the police about what is happening to the police service. Time and again, I am told that the confidence that the, police, uh, that the public have in the police, uh, that they want local policing, uh, local routes, local say, with a good relationship with the police, uh, in a phrase, what they want is neighbourhood policing. And that's why, going forward, our first and dominant priority uh, will be to rebuild uh, neighbourhood policing. Truly, as Stevens called it, the bedrock of policing. In parallel, we will drive a progressive reform agenda, uh, done with and not to the police service. Uh, we will raise standards, uh, elevating the police service to a profession on a par, for example, with doctors and lawyers. To this end, uh, the notion of the chartered police officer accountable to the College of Policing uh, with lifelong career development is an attractive one. We will uphold the highest standards, calling to account those who let the public down, whether it be individuals guilty of unacceptable behaviour or whether it be systemic failure in a police force. We will abolish the IPCC which does not command the confidence of the public or the police, uh, and we are now uh, working on potential merger with the HMIC to create a new and much more effective Police Standards Commission able to tackle both individual wrongdoing and systemic failure. Stress again, the IPCC simply does not command the confidence of the public or the police and no amount of throwing money at it, top slicing to throw money at it, uh, will make it work. We will shake up both policing and the criminal justice system, crucially putting victims centre stage, a victim's law to protect those who are too often let down. And that's why we've established the Victims Task Force, chaired by Keir Starmer, the former Director of Public Prosecutions, uh, and involving uh, Doreen Lawrence, the mother of Stephen, who was so tragically murdered by racist scum. Uh, we will drive a much more effective national procurement strategy because Stevens is right that the impact of 43 forces substantially doing their own thing just does not make sense in terms of operational effectiveness and efficiency. Uh, ensuring purchasing, for example, through the National Hub of Basic Requirements alone would save £66 million and fund 500 police officers. And Stevens is also right <coughs> that we need to equip officers with both the basic 19 technological requirements identified in time for crime and with also remote access to intelligence that would greatly enhance operational effectiveness and see police officers able to spend more time in their communities. Labour will not allow a generation of progress in the building of neighbourhood policing to be reversed. Uh, neither will we in government strike a remorselessly negative tone subscribing to the Westminster bubble myth that there is a crisis of confidence in policing. Friends, in the last four years, the police service has suffered from a government which has sometimes, to be frank, treated it with contempt. It has endured cuts that were not well thought through uh, and now is having to deal with the consequences of those mistakes. I've said it before, including to the ACPO conference, and I'll say it again. A Labour government will insist on the highest standards. You will sometimes find us a pain in the backside. Uh, we will be friends, however, but critical friends, because our job is to ensure nothing but the best for the public that we represent. But, friends, the increasingly fraught relationship is not working. Uh, both the government and the police need to make a fresh start, and that is what we are determined to do. Labour will be a champion 
of all that is best in British policing, a demanding champion, but a champion of all that is best in British policing, always putting the public first and never forgetting that the prime purpose of policing uh, is a safer, more cohesive and more just society. We have different roles, but we share a common purpose, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, just time for a, a couple of thoughts and questions. Anyone got any thoughts or questions? We've got microphones. And uh, the gentleman there, he kick us off, tell us who you are, sir, and pose your question if you would. Chris Harder, you West Yorkshire. Um, going back to the PCC yeah. uh, question again, would you um, get rid of the PCCs? Because uh, I think we heard yesterday that uh, the Home Secretary is not inclined to get rid of PCCs. Uh, there's not a group of them at her door trying to um, merge forces. But if we're going to merge forces, I think that's the only way it can be done. Well, first of all, Chris, on this point about merger of forces, see, I agree with what Irene said earlier on this week, is that what we need to do is to move beyond 2006 uh, and to do what Stephen said we must, which is to have a sensible debate about do the current arrangements of 43 forces work in the best interests of the public. No, they don't. Uh, and therefore, whilst we've ruled out police uh, England, uh, that there is an inescapable logic uh, in a reduction of the number of forces. Um, how that's done, uh, and in a way genuinely both operationally uh, effective, also achieving efficiencies um, and ensuring accountability, you can have a, a debate at the next stages about that. Uh, but I think now there's an overwhelming consensus. And so when Theresa said yesterday that police officers don't knock at her door, well, I hear the same from all three associations representing the police the whole time, that they don't think that the current arrangements work. On PCCs, uh, it is an experiment uh, that has not worked. Uh, I thought her defence yesterday of the current arrangement, uh, to say the least, uh, lacked either conviction uh, or, or, or was not compelling. Uh, we are at an advanced stage of uh, actively looking at alternative arrangements uh, to PCCs. We will be making an announcement shortly, so you'll forgive me if I don't make that announcement today. And all I would say in conclusion is two things. One is the key principle, of course, the police, you, have to be accountable to democratically elected representatives of the public. That's an absolutely key principle. But the other thing that we're focused on, very much in line with Stevens, uh, is that when she talked yesterday about accountability, uh, it was all about accountability up here at the level of the force, which of course is crucial. Of course it's crucial. But uh, it's also about accountability uh, where Joe and Josephine Soap and the dog and duck in Erdington uh, see life at local level. So that notion, therefore, uh, of, of, of how we ensure more effective engagement and accountability at grassroots level from us will be building bottom up. Uh, but uh, we'll be making our announcement shortly about up here at the top what we intend to do. I've got one at the back there and then uh, Alan down here. Uh, yes, tell us who you are. Uh, good morning, uh, Simon Ovens. I'm a Chief Superintendent with the Met. Sorry, uh, Simon. We're, I can't, the Met. I'm blind. That over there. Yeah. Oh, um, hi, Simon. Yes. Right, hi. Okay. Uh, thank you for your kind words, uh, which I certainly uh, will reflect on. I think we've actually gone be on the standoff and skirmishes are well underway. You mentioned lots of what you would do to yeah. enhance us. One thing you didn't mention was money. Yeah. Uh, the Met's just gone through savings of over 600 million. We've got another 700 million to make. And from my position, it's extraordinarily difficult to now envisage us being able to achieve that without seeing substantial reductions in their thousands of police officers uh, policing the streets of London. Is there anything you can say to me and my colleagues from the Metropolitan Police that will allow our fears and say that any incoming Labour government would stop these massive draconian cuts in order to maintain the numbers of people actually policing London? OK, Simon, it's an absolutely key question. Um, I won't say which Chief Constable, because that would be wrong. It would betray the integrity of the letter he sent to me recently. Um, uh, he said, uh, quoting from the HMIC, um, 
about how remarkably they had coped thus far uh, in ever more difficult circumstances. He then went on to say, but, 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 at the next stages, if there is a continuing remorseless reduction in resource, there will be very serious consequences in my force. Uh, we, can, we are stretched, he said, uh, now to the maximum. Um, we're very conscious of that, including what you've just said in relation to the Met. Uh, again, uh, you'll have to wait for an announcement that will be made shortly, but I would simply say this. First duty of any government is the safety and security of its citizens, in particular at a time when there are serious new threats uh, to national security, uh, and incidentally, where there are huge demands coping with the legacy of history. Uh, Chris Sims, the West Midlands uh, Chief Constable, said to me the day before yesterday, 10% of his police officers are now focused on child sex exploitation. Incidentally, rightly so, but the sheer scale of that demand is enormous. So we intend, if I can put it this way, to turn the tide. So where do you stop the cuts? Uh, wait and see the announcement in under two weeks' time. All right. uh, but we, we intend to turn the tide, uh, be, because if we continue down the path of reductions, the kind of which we've seen, there'll be very seri serious consequences. We are not going to continue down that path. It's a, a good indicator. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, we've got lots of hands up and not much time. But Alan. Yes, uh, Alan Lees from uh, West Yorkshire Police. We're yeah. currently in a coalition and post-election uh, next year could yep. be in another, in another coalition, maybe with a different uh, political party. Yeah. What have you outlined today would you be prepared to negotiate on with another party? Well, it won't be with the Conservative Party. <laughs> I can predict that with some certainty. Um, the, I'm reluctant to get drawn into it in this sense, is that we're not contemplating uh, anything else but being a majority uh, government. Um, straight answer to your question, having said that, uh, the Liberal Democrats on policing are not all bad when you talk to them as Liberal Democrats. The problem is they're in a coalition led by a Conservative Party that's been doing some dreadful things. Uh, so I think maybe they would view life a wee bit different uh, if we were uh, in government. Okay. Are you happy with that? Yeah. I'll wait to see. You'll wait to see. All right. <laughs> uh, pass the mic to somebody, a uh, gentleman there. Yes. Uh, Tony Dawson from, Met, from the Met Police. Welcome your setting up this Stevens Commission uh, and your support for it now. Does the logic of that mean that you, you accept all his recommendations? And if not, when are you going to tell us which ones you don't and why? Uh, overwhelmingly, we do. Um, indeed, I refer to a number of the key recommendations uh, earlier, Tony. Um, the only one at this stage that we've explicitly ruled out uh, is uh, Force England. Um, as I said yesterday, I can understand why Force Scotland uh, was created. And interestingly about Force Scotland, as you'll know, is the way that in, in the legislation that created Force Scotland, uh, there, there are, you know, there's, there's three levels. There's Force for Scotland and then at local authority level and then embedded at that neighborhood policing level. It's a very interesting model. But Force England it, is simply not appropriate. Overwhelmingly, Ed said it at the launch of the Stevens Commission report, uh, we accept it um, as very much uh, a, a, a way forward uh, for us. You know, it's, a, the, it's a damn good report and it points in the right direction. Would, is there any bit of it that you wouldn't want enacted? I think, no, I, I just, I think it represents a police service, it's what the public want and it's great if, if, if I wish other parties would also adopt it. One more quick one. Yes, sir. Uh, Sean Wilson, also met, please. Um, it's very clear um, over the last 10, 15 years that our communities are dramatically changing. Yeah. Uh, also, population numbers are dramatically increasing. I look at the population of London, where I think we've gone past the 9 million mark, which was significantly greater than when I first joined. The, dif the difficulty is now, this is also a lot of high profile take cases abstract huge numbers of officers. Yeah. Um, and we see them all for the right reasons, whether it's public order, yeah. whether it's uh, high profile crime, such as the Madeleine McCann case, etc. Yeah. And all very, very worthy cases. However, there is always a trade off. And where the trade off is always going to be either detectives at local level or neighbourhood police officers yeah. at a local level. 
And my plea to you is please give considerations as to where those numbers go, because the trade-off at the minute is there are swathes of communities out there that we simply do not know. It is not unusual yeah. to have um, things that are going on in the communities, and you talk about the Rotherham case, you can talk about any of the cases, there's an awful lot going on there that we need to get into. You can't do that when you take the cops away. And my simple yeah. plea is, and my request to you is, how are you going to guarantee, you said that you would, my question is how you'll guarantee um, that we protect uh, the communities and protect the cops that, they, um, that serve the communities. Uh, you make, Sean, a, a really important point, because I spoke earlier of growing demands. It's not as if, with fewer police officers, there's fewer demands. We've got the toxic combination of fewer police officers with growing demands, and demands of a very serious kind. Uh, and I mean, ISIS is a monumental threat to our national security um, on the one hand, and just the legacy of child exploita sex exploitation on the other. I was struck by that figure from the West Midlands. One in ten police officers uh, now focused on that. And incidentally, good for the West Midlands Police Service that they're doing that, because it's an absolute bloody scandal what happened in the past and what is happening to this day. Uh, but then, it's a straight answer to your question, crucially what we need, apart from strategically how we handle these issues, is both uh, more um, resource and a smarter approach. You know, so on a very simple level, it is about numbers. It's about numbers, uh, manpower, able to do the job. But of course, uh, it's about systems and, and smart technology. If I can just give an example, uh, something I saw in Essex, this excellent, excellent uh, scheme that they've got, which is a multi-agency scheme in terms of tackling domestic violence, working in a very smart way, uh, being able to finger uh, multi uh, perpetrators have been guilty of multiple examples of domestic violence. So it's about working smarter, um, and it's about, to be frank, more, uh, more uh, numbers. And then just one final thing, which again I absolutely take from what you said. You know, when we were in the Q&A yesterday, and I gave the example again of the West Midlands about what had led to a very large number of convictions for terrorist crime, it was actually because police, in a, in a strategic approach, best of neighbourhood policing, engaging with communities, in particular with the Muslim communities, a lot of patient time and effort, relationships were developed of trust and confidence, and that enabled then uh, the police to identify those guilty of wrongdoing. Um, so in your point about having the time to engage, particularly in London, with the nature of London, having time to engage is a point very well made. It comes back to, as I say, resource and, ha and a smart way of working.